We're going to move now to our next pioneer, number 13 in our series. We're reaching pretty close to the halfway mark of these 27 pioneers on our 27 pioneer timeline here. This gentleman is named Roswell Finner Cottrell. He usually goes by R.F. Cottrell. And here's a picture of him in his later years. Uh, kindly looking man there. Uh, by the way, if you do want to see another picture too, here's a picture in his younger years. <laughs> so anyway, and probably most of what we're going to be re reading about is when he looked like this, oh, not sorry. not like that, because yeah. he was a young fellow when he started getting involved. Um, I mean, we don't know the specific date on that that I'm aware of. Who is this gentleman, Brother Cottrell? He was born in 1814. By the way, the our issue of Lest We Forget we have on Volume 4, Number 2, looks like this. There's a pencil drawing of him, and there's a title of one of his poems on the front, and the poem itself, too, which we'll, which we'll reference later on here. It's Jewish. Obviously, we're dealing with someone who is also, like Rachel was, a Sabbath keeper. January 17, 1814, he's born in Brookfield, New York, just east of Syracuse, son of John Cottrell, and the background on the Cottrell family is as follows. The Cottrells descended from the Cotterells, which means cottage dwellers, who were among the Albigenses, Catherans, Paterans, Aragonus, Navarus, and Basque, who were listed as heretics to be exterminated in southwestern France by Pope Alexander III in 1178. 1178. This was back in the time, there's a book recently written called The Most Holy War, <coughs> and it was the Albigensian Crusade, the beginning of genocide in the Christian era. Amazing, amazing book. Um, among the survivors of this purge, this genocidal uh, effort on the part of, the, uh, of Pope Alexander was a John Cotterell who escaped to northern France and then to England. Centuries later, one of his descendants, Nicholas Cotterell, because they changed the name to Cotterell, settled in Rhode Island of all places in 1638, just two years after Roger Williams fled there after being banished from Massachusetts. So again, what's the picture? Persecution. Persecution from France to England to Rhode Island. For freedom. For freedom of religion. Okay, freedom of religion. And Nicholas, somewhere along the line, he or his ancestors picked up the seventh day. Because Nicholas was a Seventh-day Baptist who sought freedom to worship according to his conscience. And there was only one colony to start with that would allow that. That was Rhode Island. Amazing story. Here's where the story of Roger Williams sort of has some connections with the threads that come to Adventism. Because Roger Williams went there and he decided to establish a colony where he could believe, he was not a Sabbath keeper, he could, he could he, but I think there's some connection between him and the Sabbath. I'm not clear in my mind, and I didn't do the research on that when I was putting this together, but he actually made plans to establish a colony that in its charter, its founding charter, would be freedom of conscience. You can believe what you want to believe. He would debate with people who he didn't agree with, but he would grant them freedom. They could hold office. <laughs> they were not re discriminated in any sense there. So, and it's amazing that that seed of freedom spread to the other colonies. The smallest of all the colonies. <laughs> he, he that is least shall be the greatest, right? <laughs> the smallest of all the colonies, and still uh, it's the smallest of all the states. It's smaller than the county we sit in. San Bernardino County is bigger than Rhode Island. This colony affected the other colonies. As we mentioned under, under Rachel's story, Rachel Preston's story, this amazing cradle of religious liberty. So there, in, in Rhode Island, Nicholas settles. Six generations later, Roswell is born, 1814. 
His father, John Cottrell, had taught the children to keep the Seventh-day Sabbath, though they had withdrawn, the family had withdrawn from the Seventh-day Baptists due to disagreement over other teachings, like the immortality of the soul. So again, these people were reformers, free thinkers, recovering Bible truth. They got the Sabbath, and they at some point said, wait now, this teaching about immortality of the soul is not in the Bible. And so they left the Seventh-day Baptist, but they hung on to the Sabbath. Okay? What did Roswell do? In 1833, he's 19 years old, he moves with his family to Mill Grove, New York. And as best I could tell, that's down closer to the Pennsylvania border. I'm not positive on the location of that one. Um, we think it's about two years later, he's, he's around 21 then, he marries Catherine Harvey. He taught public school for 10 years. He and Catherine has three boys, Willet, Frank, and James Uriah. Um, Uriah was named after Uriah Smith, which means that's a few years later, right? Um, and a daughter, Nancy. It was, it was their third son, James, who had a son named Roy Franklin Cottrell, who was a missionary, Seventh-day Adventist missionary to China, and a grandson, Raymond F. Cottrell, who was a former book editor for the Review who actually spent his last years here, I believe it was. So, the next thing that we find in Brother Cottrell's story is that we come to the era of the Millerite <coughs> teachings. I put 44, but it could have been years earlier, the years leading up to that. I don't know when he first was exposed to it, probably long before 44, because they were preaching it all around in those early years of the 40s. He's around 30 years of age, at the, at the passing of the time, he rejects the Millerite message. Why? This is, this, is, this, is what he, this is what he recounts in the Review and Herald of 1851, some seven years later. This is why he did not accept the Millerite message, teachings. My early education was such that I have believed in the personal appearing of Christ according to the scriptures. So it's not because he didn't believe Christ was coming. In 1843 and 44, I heard the solemn cry, the hour of his judgment is come. And though I felt no disposition to oppose it and thought I loved his righteous appearing, yet I was not disappointed when the time passed. I saw the proclamation, the proclaimers, I saw the proclaimers of the advent in darkness in regard to the commandments of God and bowing to an institution of papacy. And perhaps this was the reason I did not believe. So again, I, I think Christ is coming, but these people that are promoting this date, they're worshiping on the Pope's Sabbath. There must be something missing here. You know? So, isn't that amazing? Well, if he believed like some of those others did, but how can they be violating God's law? Exactly. <clears throat> and the Lord come for them. Exactly. I mean, after all, the practicality of it is, mm -hmm. if the Lord had come, the devil would have torn them apart with that Sabbath truth. He yeah. would have rubbed their noses in it, and their faith would have been shattered. Yeah. It, so that's why we cannot have any guile if we're to go through the end. Yeah, the point is that the, those that at the end are pictured as having no guile, which means they've recovered, they've recovered the truth. So that was from the Review and Herald, November 25, 1851, that testimony that he wrote in, in that uh, issue. Six years later, 1850, he hears the third angel's message, and he accepts it. This is how he recounts that. Since I heard, since I have heard the message of the third angel, which was since the commencement of the Review and Herald, and I, that's why I put 1850, because that's when the Review and Herald was pu first published. I have reviewed carefully, again, he's writing this in 1851, so we, we know that's roughly the time period when he's, when he's getting exposed to it. If I understand correctly, he, he heard of it from... Uh, Brother Bates and someone else. They were preaching the third angel's message, right? And again, the third angel's message in the, in the understanding of the 
of that group of Sabbath of, of, of Adventists, the third angel's message was the Sabbath and the sanctuary message combined. When they when they added that to the Advent message, they became um, they call it the third angel's message. Since I have heard the message of the third angels, which was since the commencement of the Review and Herald, I have reviewed carefully the whole movement. And the solemn inquiry in my mind has been, was it from heaven or of men? He saw something missing in the Millerite movement. So he's hearing now another message, still preaching about the coming of Christ, but with additional concepts. Is it of heaven, from heaven, or of men? After some nine months, interestingly enough, good gestation period, right? <laughs> After some nine months, careful and cautious examination, I have just arrived at the decision. I believe, I believe with my, with all my heart, it was from heaven. I cannot believe that God would suffer Satan to get up so exact a fulfillment of the prophecies to deceive the lovers of Jesus Christ. Those who wait and look for his appearing. If any one inquire how I can believe all this, since Christ did not appear according to the expectations of his children, I answer, we are instructed, Revelation 14, that an angel should fly through the midst of heaven, saying, Fear God, for the hour of his judgment is come, and yet there is time for two other messages to follow in succession before the Son of Man is seen in the white cloud. I greatly rejoice that when the temple of God was opened in heaven, his children on earth saw, by faith, the ark of his testament. Revelation 11:19. This is obviously the text that Bates was preaching. <laughs> and he saw the connection there. And he said, yes, there's some more messages to come before Christ comes. And the third angel's message is, is, is the, the last of those three in Revelation 14. And then we see the Son of Man on the cloud. Okay? And so he was convinced. Nine months. And if this is, again, when he wrote this in November, this actually would go back to the beginning of 1851, right? So it may have actually been 1851 that he first heard it, rather than 1850. So somewhere in that time, uh, time period, he, he was exposed to the third angel's message, and after nine months of examination, proving all things, he held fast to that which was good. And that year that he wrote this, in fact, the month before he wrote that, November was when that was published. This is actually October. He, he has a poem that he sends to the review. It's entitled, It's Jewish. Let me read it to you. When we present God's holy law and arguments from Scripture draw, objectors say, to pick a flaw, it's Jewish. Though at the first Jehovah blessed the, and sanctified his day of rest, the same belief is still expressed. It's Jewish. Though with the world this rest began, and thence through all the scripture ran, and Jesus said, "'Twas made for man," it's Jewish. Though not with Jewish rites which passed, but with the moral law 'twas classed, which must endure while time shall last, it's Jewish. Though the disciples, Luke and Paul, continues still this rest to call the Sabbath day. This answers all. It's Jewish. The gospel teacher's plain expression that sin is of the law transgression seems not to make the least impression. It's Jewish. They love the rest of man's invention, but if Jehovah's day we mention, this puts an end to all contention. It's Jewish. That was the poem he wrote. He was, a, he was an accomplished poet. And I'll read some others here to you as well. His great-grandson, I'm sorry, his grandson, who 
James, now this would be his great grandson. Roswell's son was James. His grandson would be Roy Franklin, and his great grandson would be uh, R.F. Cottrell. He added three more verses to it. Shall I read them? Thus the apostles too must fall, for Andrew, Peter, James, and Paul, and Thomas, Matthew, and John, and all were Jewish. <laughs> but when old earth shall pass away and be renewed, the Sabbath day honored by all, none then will say it's Jewish. And while eternity's glad days roll on and on with ceaseless rays, the theme will be Jehovah's praise, and that in universal lays, not Jewish. So he added that to it as well. Eighteen fifty-four, when he's fit forty years old, he's ordained by James White. And I imagine again, this probably is how he's looking in those early years. This yeah. younger picture here. So we get a get a little idea of, of of his personality by the expression on his face there. Well, the poem it does. The poem fits the face. He begins the same year, 1854, a series entitled Sabbath School Lessons in the Youth Instructor, and they're published through July of 1855. First Sabbath School Lessons being published, okay? In 1855, when the series is over with, that Bible lesson series is published as a book, The Bible Class. It, in that same year, he became a correspondent for the review when it moved to Battle Creek, Michigan. Also, he's 41 years old, okay? He becomes a tent master in New York with J.N. Loughborough. And how old is Loughborough? 23. <laughs> Loughborough is preaching in the tent, and he has this 41-year-old tent master that helps him pitch the tent. In fact, here's Loughborough's uh, recalling the, the uh, incident. In, the, in Loughborough's uh, Miracles in uh, My Life um, the, on, on the CD-ROM. Our winter labors of 1854 and 55 were in the state of New York. Again, Loughborough was born in 32. Okay? So he, he's, he's, just, he's just heard. Remember what we said under, under uh, Rachel Preston? Loughborough accepted the message in 1852 from Jan Andrews. So this is like three years later. And he's going all around doing evangelism. Our winter labors in 54 to 55 were in the state of New York. You can imagine uh, the major labors were in the summer. They easy to travel and whatever. But they still worked in the wintertime. Because you could get around on, with sleigh. You know, that type of thing. They were in the state of New York. When our people heard, when our people there learned of the tent effort success in Michigan, See, the first, the first tent that we bought in, for evangelism was in Michigan. And when the people in New York heard about it, they purchased a tent and a wagon for New York. They also bought and presented to me the horse and carriage formerly used in the travels of Elder and Mrs. White. Interesting. So this, this evangelist is being helped by the believers in that state buying him transportation. <laughs> Didn't have cars. They <laughs> bought him a horse and a carriage. There's also a wagon, probably to carry the tent around in, right? Because the tent had to be folded up. Whatever. A 60-foot tent was purchased on the last of May, 1855, and erected in the dooryard of Har Harvey Cottrell of Milgrove. See, that's where, that's where the Cottrell family had moved. And I believe Harvey must have been one of uh, Roswell's brothers, I would imagine. I didn't check that out. Here with R.F. Cottrell for Tentmaster, our summer efforts began. So again, there's the Loughborough's story there of the summer of 55 when uh, Cottrell's helping him there. The, re the record is that a few years later, he's preaching to the Seneca Indians through an interpreter. So not only is he an author, he's writing uh, lessons in the youth instructor, he's writing poetry. He's also a preacher himself who goes out and, and does preaching. Yes, he had a burden for the Native Americans. He's preaching to them through an interpreter, giving them the message. Um, 
Next year, 1858, he's 44 years old, February 25, he writes an article for the review entitled Spiritual Gifts. This article is amplified, and it's used as a 12-page introduction to a book by the name of Spiritual Gifts, Volume 1, by Ellen White. Do you know what that is? Have you seen those little tiny books, Spiritual Gifts? Volume 1. This is a little tiny book that's sort of like these size of those little testimonies that they were publishing. And the introduction is, a, is an expanded uh, copy of his article on spiritual gifts. What does it do? It gives the scriptural background for believing that the <coughs> gift of prophecy is still God's method of speaking to his people. And this is the end of that introduction in spiritual gifts. The testimony of Jesus... The testimony of Christ was confirmed in the Corinthian church, and what was the result? They came behind in no gift. Are we not justified then in the conclusion that when the remnant are fully confirmed in the testimony of Jesus, they will come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ? Again, look at 1 Corinthians 1, I think it is. That's exactly what it states there in that, in that passage. He's re referencing that. I remember taking a class in college from a man by the name of Robert Francis. And he used this very verse in Corinthians to address that. First Corinthians 1, verse 6 and 7. Verse 6 and 7. Um, let me start with verse 4. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given you by Jesus Christ, that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. So they have to give yes. And that, that's the verse that he uses here to wrap up the scriptural introduction for the Ellen White's first, I guess we could say it's her first major volume, isn't it? Spiritual Gifts, Volume 1. It's, it's her first publication, I believe, of the Great Controversy uh, Overview. Spiritual Gifts, Volume 1. A couple of years later, he's 46 years old, and the publishing work has been going on now for 10 years plus, and they're needing to decide who's going to own the assets of this publishing work, this building and building and building. And so there begins a discussion. James White actually calls for a discussion on what are we going to do to organize. Okay? And he immediately writes back, and he debates church organization in the review under the title of Making Us a Name. That comes from Genesis 11.4, when it says that the that the descendants of Noah built a tower saying, let us make us a name. And he said, this is Babylonian <laughs> to do this. Um, but the publishing association <coughs> organization and the church name was voted. Now, here, here's actually uh, what he wrote. Dear Brother Smith, Brother White has asked the brethren to speak in relation to his proposal to secure the property of the church. I do not know precisely what measure he intends in his suggestion, but understand it is to get incorporated as a religious body according to the law. For myself, I think it would be wrong to make us a name, since that lies at the foundation of Babylon. This is March the 22nd, 1860 in the Review. James White rebutted him the very next week. <laughs> And then in April 26, writes a lengthy response. And there's much discussion back and forth under this title. And you can find discussions even not under that title in the, in the issues of the review. They're all on the CD-ROM because we covered clear through 1866 on the CD-ROM. Um, much of discussions clear through until at least November of 19 of 1861 under the title Making, Making Us a Name. And this is a comment that he makes in May. That first one was in March 22nd. Now it's May 3. Brother Smith. See, Brother Smith's the editor, so they're writing to the editor. Brother Smith. I hope no harm will be done to the blessed cause in which we are engaged by the expression of my judgment 
in regard to making us a name. I hope and pray and trust that the Lord will give wisdom and direction in this matter and that the will of the Lord may be done. I do not fear for the ark of God nor distrust the fidelity of my brethren. I have full confidence in the infallibility of the work in which we are engaged. The last message of mercy will not fail of a harmonious fulfillment and those only will be translated who are found in harmony with this work of the Lord. I hope no fanatical spirit will make this a pretext for nourishing a spirit of division or insubordination. See, he was not a rebel when he was opposing it. You see the point he's making. I hope that no one will join my party, for when they have severed themselves from the body and look about for me, they will not find me there. For by the grace of God, I shall be found with the body. I do not believe in popery, neither do I believe in anarchy but in Bible order, discipline, and government in the church of God. See, there's two ditches. On one side, there's this spirit of independence, which he actually labels as anarchy. And the other side, the other ditch, you have a hierarchy. Everyone controlled from Rome, as it were, or some other place, Battle Creek, or Silver Spring, we could say now. <laughs> Wherever your capital happens to be, <laughs> those are the two ditches and he's, he's saying I, I'm not arguing for either one of those I'm not saying that the, 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 the solution to Babylon is anarchy no there is godly order and this is exactly what God led the, our believers to establish godly representative form of, of, of church government not perfect but nothing human is perfect right he continues uh, the next paragraph the church have my judgment concerning this matter and have heard some of my reasons for that judgment. Now, if it is right, now, if it is right, I'm sorry, now, if it is right, may it prevail. But if wrong, may the right prevail. Lord, give wisdom and direction is my prayer. RFC. He was excited. RFC. So, that's his testimony. Um, in 1861, he actually writes an apology for objecting to church organization after Ellen White rebuked him. Ellen White talks about how there was very few people standing behind them at this time. She yeah. and James felt like they were almost totally alone. Right. And she said a lot of them waited till they saw which way the tide was going, and then they put all their energy in, yeah. in writing for the positive part. Yeah. She said, where were, they, where were they when we needed them? Yeah. And then there were a lot of confessions. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like, you know, they're human beings. And it's easy to have a wrong idea and come to wrong conclusions. And um, apparently they were not fasting and praying as they, as they ought um, to really seek the Lord's guidance and his direction and waiting on the Lord, you know. Is there a word from the Lord? Well, this is what she wrote, and it's in volume uh, one of the testimonies. Um, this is actually testimony number six, which are those little testimonies she put out, number six. It's mentioned in her, the first volume of her Ellen White's biography, page 435. And he also references the first volume of the testimonies for the church, page 211. I was shown the wrong stand taken by RFC. <laughs> she calls him by his initials too. In the review in regard to organization and the distracting influence he exerted. He did not sufficiently weigh the matter. So again, it sounds like that later statement of his in May was more balanced than the earlier one, which is saying this is Babylon, basis of Babylon. Okay. And so here's his response, March 12 of 1861. I wish to counteract and remove, as far as possible, the injurious influence of my hasty communication on the subject of legal organization. I did not weigh the matter as I should. I ought to have considered that Brother White had seen the necessity of some measures being taken and had pondered the subject well before making the request he did concerning it. See, Brother White, if he had a burden, he would, he would put a note in the review. I have a burden about this. Let me know what you think. And then he start getting responses. Well, it's clear Brother Cottrell just off the top of his head very quickly, boom, sent a response back without thinking it through. He's acknowledging that here. 
he said, I ought to have considered that. Then I might have con suggested a plan of organization, avoiding the evil which I feared, which was Babylonian hierarchy, instead of the, thus confidently and self-complacently recommending that nothing should be done, which obviously didn't help Brother White in the burden that he was carrying, right? I regret that I did not consider the matter carefully and prayerfully before writing in a manner not calculated to keep the unity of the Spirit. I hope that none will stumble over this into perdition. I ask forgiveness of all the dear people of God. I hope that God himself will forgive me. And I also hope that the lesson that I have thus dearly learned may never be forgotten by me while there is danger of my falling into a similar error. My determination is to renew my consecration to God and his cause and strive to press onward till victory be gained. Brethren, pray for me. RFC. March, 20, March 12, 1861. These were, these were honest and humble people. They were moldable. They were flexible. That's why they were reformers. That's why they were moving with the advancing light. And God kept them, uh, you know, with some failings, uh, moving on, too. Amazing uh, advances in these early years, although Ellen White did rebuke them many times for not being... Um, I mean, 1861, that was after the Laodicean message was being preached. They were, they were Laodicean as well. And in our formative years, especially, we needed to give prophecy. <clears throat> to bump us back onto the path sometimes. Yes. Because human beings they wobble. Thank God for the gift of prophecy. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Thank God. And it's still functioning. Yeah. Um, not the living messenger in our midst, no. but the writings are there. The writings are there. There are enough different kinds of testimony. people that are, that are reprimanded in right. prophecy that fit just about everybody. Every situation. The next month, that was March the 12th, April 16, he's, he's, he's writing a po another poem. This is a fairly lengthy poem, and we have it published here in the, lest we forget. It's entitled, The Three Persecuting Powers, The Dragon, the False Prophet, and the Beast. Uh, let me just read you a, a couple uh, verses from this. On Patmos' lonely island, the love disciples saw three notable oppressors with saints proclaiming war. The first, the great red dragon, with features fierce and rare, the pagan superstition erecting everywhere. But after some few ages, the dragon's power grew weak. His votaries forsook him, the living God to seek. So feigned he to conversion, and lo, the beast arose, with all his papal terror, truth's progress to oppose. The ancient pagan images, its doctrines and its laws, were now entitled Christian to help his hellish cause. T'was thus the wily serpent pursued his artful plan, and ages upon ages the blood of martyrs ran. But two and forty months was all the time allowed the beast, and ere the period ended, so had his strength decreased. His days of rule were shortened, his power to call for blood. The earth had opened her mouth for saints and swallowed up the flood. And yet there is another to act upon the sage, Though through whom the same old serpent will manifest his rage, a beast which, though he outwardly was lamb like, fair and mild, spake like the pagan dragon, ferocious, loud, and wild. Though all men are made equal, so holds he in his creed, the slaves from out their bondage must nevermore be freed. And though in things religious all men are to be free, it means when laws divine with human laws agree. Once empires, thrones, and kingdoms with papacy made bold to slay the host of martyrs with cruelties untold, but now a fair republic, a Protestant so mild, usurps the dangerous power and with the same runs wild. The, re old, red dra uh, the old red pagan dragon turned papist on the day. He saw the change, he saw the turned papist on the day he saw the Christian doctrines were like to, uh, to bear the sway. He seizes on the scriptures and keeps them all unseen and offers for a stipend to tell what they must mean. At length from out its prison, the Bible has been freed and loudly now is heralded 
as Protestants' sole creed. The cry is now the Bible, the Bible, that alone. Come drink from the pure fountain that flows from out the throne. High hopes are wildly, widely cherished. The Bible has been freed. And now tis thought that Satan is overcome indeed. He sees that mere profession is but an azure ga a gauze. And lo, he now espouses with Protestants their cause. The Bible, scattered broadcast, is laid upon the shelf. And man is seldom met with one, uh, and, and man is seldom met with who reads it for himself. And though some few, like Timothy, have read it from their youth, tradition still is followed instead of living truth. The last, the last great persecution is drawing on because some few will heed the Bible and keep its righteous laws. While others, the great masses professing still the same, hold on to papal errors and all their groundless claim. The battle soon is coming. Choose now, while yet ye may, the Bible and its precepts, and Jesus to obey. Soon closes up probation. Then will the dragon rage, and battle with the remnant most cruel will he wage. But short will be the conflict, victorious the saints, redeemed from all oppression and freed from all complaints, with shouts and songs celestial, triumphant will they sing the praises and the victories of Jesus Christ their King. That was his poem on the three persecuting powers, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, which is in Revelation 12 and Revelation 13. 1865, at the age of 51, he becomes, um, we could say he enters into some part of his administrative phase of ministry. Secretary of the New York Conference twice during the next six years and of the New York Pennsylvania Conference. So during the six years from 65 to, to uh, 71. At, at the age of 54 and 68, he's actually president of the New York Conference for two years. And then somewhere in the early 80s, um, he turned 64 in 1880, he was chaplain of the Battle Creek Sanitarium for some time, probably when he looked a little bit like this <laughs> and not like, like he did here in the earlier years. In 1892, at the age of 78, he dies. On the CD-ROM, in addition to the titles uh, that we mentioned, the Bible class and spiritual gifts, he also has some other small um, pamphlet types of things called Both Sides, dealing with um, the Sabbath, the Mark of the Beast and the Seal of the Living God, obviously also dealing with the Sabbath, and something that he called truth. These people were people that were looking for truth. And he, he wrote something on that as well. The bulk of his writing, though, I'd have to say, is not in pamphlets on the cd -ROM. You go to the 27 volumes of the Review and Herald that we have on there through 1866. You'll find the bulk of what he wrote there in the periodicals. The bulk of the, the pioneers in general is in periodicals, their publications at least. Uh, the, the books often were published articles put together into a book form. That's often the way that, 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 that they developed. Um, since he died in uh, 92, it'd be interesting to find out how long he wrote in the review. Whether during his years as an administrator, was he still writing? We have through 1866, so we could check on, on the CD-ROM how, how long his name. I actually found out that you can search for initials. Just type in R space F space C. And then you find every place where RFC shows up. So um, don't only have to don't only have to look for Cottrell, but you can also look for his initials. But again, what do we learn from the li from the life of um, RF Cottrell? What would we say he's known the most for in terms of the landmark truths? Investigate things thoroughly. Okay. I think with his, he 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 supported the spiritual gifts very much, ministry of Ellen White. But with his heritage, apparently going back further even than Rachel Preston's on with the Seventh Day Baptist, I do believe, um, even though he was not one of the early promoters, 
of the Sabbath. He, he, didn't, he, he was not with the group until 1850-51. Okay. He was a believer in the Sabbath. And he obviously brought to the movement a very strong Sabbath heritage. And his skills in two distinct ministries of the church, maybe we could actually add a third, publishing, being, being a, a correspondent for the review, writing, being an administrator in the church, okay, organization of the church, that, that ministry of the church has been given. And then we could say also perhaps evangelism, preaching to the Indians, helping Loughborough with his evangelistic <coughs> meetings too. And um, we can thank God for his descendants as well that have, that have helped the church, even though the, the latest one abandoned the message of 1844 before he died. Um, gave a lot of contribution in the Bible commentary and the other things that, uh, that are a blessing. And the early writings are still there, being made available to us on the computer. We thank God for that. So again, we thank God for these pioneers. We've done, like we said, now 13 of the 27, and we want to keep moving uh, through the rest in the future.